After describing the virgin birth through Mary, the creed omits other details of his life. It says nothing about his ministry on earth or the miracles he performed. Rather, it moves straight to his death and has that extraordinary phrase, suffered under Pontius Pilate. It's interesting that the creed singles out Pontius Pilate by name. How strange it is and how bizarre that we have a second-rate Roman provincial governor in the Christian creed, so that every time that I say the creed in church, I mention this man, Pontius Pilate, who actually not many people, even in the first century, had heard of, and how come he's got there? We know a bit about Pontius Pilate from records outside of the scriptures, but quite frankly, none of us today living would have ever heard of Pontius Pilate. About God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Mary, we're talking about the Apostles' Creed, we're talking about the most noble concepts we have, and in the middle of it, we have a two-bit, Roman governor named Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate becomes the second best known person who's ever lived, only for the fact that he was with Jesus for about an hour. The greatest theologian to my taste of the 20th century, Karl Barth, always says, here you are at a banquet and uh, in comes a, a mutt, uh, kind of a dirty dog. It's beautiful that he's there. This is the only time in the creed that we make a reference to a human person who is in fact known to us from the pages of secular history. Outside the Gospels, the New Testament, we can find in various texts in the ancient world references to the fact that Pontius Pilate was the governor of Palestine at the time when Christ died. That indicates that our Christian faith is a historical faith. We're dealing with history here. We're not dealing with fiction, fairy tale real people in real time. Jesus was real. He died on a cross. Pontius Pilate is a governor. And the records of his governorship can be found. I mean, they, they, they've come down to us. This is not just a legend or a myth. This is history. This really happened. Christianity, different from many of the other religions and, and different from being merely another ism. There are plenty of philosophers uh, in the world and plenty of philosophies that people have shaped around a set of ideas trying to grapple with the meaning and significance of, of our world. But Christianity is different uh, and unique. It draws on its Jewish roots. Uh, it's from the same family uh, of faiths and the Jews believed very strongly uh, to the fact that God wasn't just an idea and he wasn't just there somewhere in the universe, but he stepped into the world and made a difference. So the great events of the Jewish nation were that he delivered them from oppression in Egypt, that an exodus took place. And that was a historic event to which they could look back and repeat and teach their children. Uh, not, not a myth, but an actual event. And that same trajectory takes place and leads us to Jesus, that God doesn't just give us in our minds an idea that he loves us or that he can save us, but he actually shows us in human form, in history, in a place, in culture, that he's sent his son uh, to do something about our problem and to give us a way out of our dilemma, uh, to grant us salvation and the forgiveness of sins. And he does that in the person of his son. And Jesus is uh, a, a person with a date in history. 
we say that uh, he died under Pontius Pilate and on the third day he rose again. Those are facts at the basis of our faith that puts our faith in an altogether different category from many of the isms in the world. The necessity of emphasizing the historical, physical, earthly, human existence of God in Christ was, was focal. And this was another way to do it. We know about Pilate from Roman sources and particularly from the Jewish historian called Josephus who tells us a very great deal about the period of Jesus and so on. And we know from those sources that Pilate was not a very good governor, not a very good politician. He was a bit of a bully. Like many bullies, he was a weak man at heart, so he could be pulled and pushed this way and that, and then when he thought things were getting out of hand, he would lash out. He seems to have been not a particularly successful governor. We might guess that from the account in the Gospels, his hesitations and indecisiveness. We're in the midst of a mob scene. We have a governor here who uh, doesn't know what authority he has or anything like that. It's above his head. He's lost it all. He sort of wants to buy peace. He wants to do anything like that. It's, he's kind of a skullduggery type, not high ethics. Pretty hard to think of greater injustice than that. Jesus is coming out before the people. He sentenced him to death, releasing him to the mob. He's going to be uh, scourged and then crucified. And Pilate seeks to wash his hands in water. But all the water in the world could not wash those hands clean. But one drop of the blood of the hands of Jesus on that cross could have done the job. And so Pilate is a way both of earthing the story, this really happened, and we know when it happened. It happened in the late 20s or early 30s of the first century AD in Palestine, in Jerusalem. But also of saying Jesus did the classic thing of going into the vortex where political power was doing its worst. Pilate was simply the cat's paw of this massive system called the Roman Empire, which crushed everything that got in its way and sent out lesser people like Pilate to do the dirty work. And so many people in the world today, when they say the creed, face similar situations where political and social forces are squashing them and grinding them. And it is a huge comfort for them to believe and know that Jesus himself was in that place where the great empire, through one of its little local henchmen, had actually been responsible for his death. So it's both a historical memory and a very powerful impetus for people to identify with that today. Very interesting that the creed says he suffered under Pontius Pilate. It says he died, but it first says he suffered. One of the truly odd things about Christianity is that it focuses on the suffering of the central figure and his dying. If we go to the Gospels, all four deal at some length with the last hours of Jesus. The suffering was intense. He suffered um, as probably no other person has ever suffered. I don't think the important thing is how badly he suffered. It's who's doing the suffering. I have spoken on this subject at a chapel a few feet away from a huge hospital. And it occurs to me some people lying there with cancer are suffering, 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 absolute agony for many days, and maybe hurt as much as what it hurt for his crucifixion for those hours. But uh, who they are and who I am when we die, uh, we're not representative. For him, the whole weight of the story of God's dealing with us comes to bear. There was physical suffering, but there was more. There was mental suffering. There was spiritual suffering. It's true that he suffered in a number of ways through his life, an amazing number of ways that relate to the ways in which you and I suffer today. Every pain and suffering that humans feel, Christ also experienced. From the very beginning, Christ is suffering because, as the Gospel of John says, the world cannot see. There in his very early days, there was the slur of his birth being an illegitimate birth. There's no place for him to be born. He has to flee the country. He's in those early days taken as a young baby down into Egypt as a refugee. He's a displaced person. 
in his public ministry, he's harassed by the Pharisees. He's not considered a prophet in his own land. He shares in the suffering of poverty without having a home of his own or a place to lay his head. He's often rejected. He's ridiculed and subject to rumor and misunderstanding. He lived the life of suffering. But climaxes, of course, in the suffering that you see recorded in the Garden of Gethsemane and you witness as he is uh, flogged and then uh, crucified in exquisite form of inflicting pain. And all his civil, all his judicial, all his human, all his rights are violated. In the prophecy of Isaiah it is said, surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrow. We need to say all our grief, all our sorrow he has carried. Of course, the suffering began in Gethsemane when he wrestled that evening before, and then it reached its climax on the cross. Perhaps the best known stories of human tragic death in all of world literature, certainly Western literature, are the death of Socrates and the death of Jesus. Socrates, the great philosophical teacher who went to his death because uh, he maintained his innocence when the court wanted to convict him of teaching stuff that was corrupting the youth. And then Jesus, of course, went to his death in a rather different way, but equally on a charge of, among other things, false teaching. But Socrates lay on his deathbed, uh, drank the hemlock, which was the poison that he had officially to drink, discoursed to his friends about the meaning of life, the meaning of death and philosophy and so on and died very peacefully while they were all broken-hearted and so on, but he maintained a kind of noble composure to the end. Jesus, interestingly, is very, very different when we see him particularly in the scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, where, according to Luke's Gospel, he actually sweated drops of blood. Now, that has been studied medically, and it has been demonstrated that some people, under intense emotional pressure and threat, actually can and do sweat blood and it looked as though that's preserving a real historical memory which tells you that Jesus was under the most appalling emotional pressure. He knew what crucifixion meant. It meant slow, very, very unpleasant torture, torture of the entire body where every nerve and part of the body was being tortured simultaneously and that was exceedingly nasty and anyone in their right mind would shrink from it so that even though Jesus has been absolutely clear that he has to go to Jerusalem and do this, when the moment comes, he says to the Father, isn't there another way? Have I misunderstood? Could we not do this differently somehow? And he wrestles in prayer until he settles it in his mind that no, this is the way it has to be. And what we see in Gethsemane is Jesus as a fully 100% human being. Jesus is not a demigod pretending to be human. Jesus is not saying, oh well, it'll be nasty in a way, but then I'm divine, so who cares, and in three days it'll be all right. He's not beginning to say anything like that. It's an act of extraordinary faith and obedience to his vocation that he goes to his death in the way that he does. We read of the crowds around Jesus on the day of the crucifixion, and they shouted abuse at him, come down and save yourself. He stayed there and he saved us instead. There's the other side to it, and that is the spiritual suffering. His physical pain was very great, but his mental and spiritual anguish and agony were surely greater. Mark even goes so far as to record that cry of anguish when he's on the cross. The words, why have you forsaken me, are uh, far more challenging than the words, I thirst. To feel that God has forsaken him, the Son of God, with the ultimate purpose, the ultimate savior, the messianic entry into history, to feel that he is forsaken by God is the ultimate spiritual suffering. Just as in Gethsemane, he is struggling to go on believing that the one he calls Abba, Father, really does want him to do this crazy thing. I mean, see, other people said he was mad. His friends said he was mad. His mother and his brothers said he was mad. It must have crossed his mind that maybe he was, actually. 
I think anyone in his position would be bound to say, am I deluded? Am I chasing a dream? Have I been silly all this time? After all, everybody knew it's failed messiahs who end up on crosses, not successful messiahs. And so when Jesus is then hanging on the cross and his enemies are around the foot of the cross saying, uh -huh, yeah, you are gonna destroy the temple. You think you're the messiah. Well, now prove it, come down from the cross there must have been some part of his mind and his imagination which must have said, you know, they might just be right. And then the question is, what does Jesus' vocation do with that question? And the answer is it goes back to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, you find a prayer of one who feels like that, who thinks like that, but who holds on to that thought in the presence of God. And what is that prayer? We call it Psalm 22. He uttered the words from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? My God, my God, why did you abandon me? Christ was not just quoting the Psalms, he meant every word that he said. So he suffers the desolation of separation from the father with whom he'd been so intimate and walked so closely. That cry is the ultimate human cry. Part of our human experience into which Christ enters is the experience of desolation, loneliness, and even despair. In despair, because he cannot see beyond the darkness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Human beings also undergo the suffering that they feel abandoned by God. That's why it occurs in Psalm 22. I led a retreat last summer with some doctors, and we were asking, what's the worst? Is it pain or aloneness? All the doctors said aloneness is worst. People can endure all kinds of pain if they don't feel God has abandoned them, if they feel their relatives are praying for them. Being alone is the terrible thing. And for that moment, Jesus asks what has happened? Am I being abandoned? When Calvin preached on Job, all of Job's pains, all of the things taken away from Job, nothing was as bad for Job as the feeling that God had abandoned him. That was the ultimate temptation for Job, according to Calvin, is that Job had been abandoned by God. Now this occurs in contemporary literature, in Graham Greene's The Heart of the Matter. Scobie is in the church, and he wants to commit suicide. He's at a moment of despair. And yet, he hears Christ say to him, how can you take yourself, how can you take your life? How can you commit suicide? When I have died for you, I have claimed you, you cannot take yourself away. And despair is a very important point here because spiritual despair the feel that you are beyond the reach of God, either because God has turned away from you or the fear that you have turned away so far from God that nobody cares, including God. The fear that God can't reach you or won't reach you is spiritual despair. And that spiritual despair is answered by the cross, that God never forsakes you that God can reach you no matter how deep and far he has to reach. One of the ways Luther expressed this that I like the best is that the creation from nothing becomes the way God acts in every human life. That we come to a point of spiritual nothingness. We come to a point of utter despair. And just as God created the world out of this nothingness, he will bring us back out of this nothingness and make us a child of God. In saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I believe he is expressing the fact that he is bearing at that point our sin and that his Father, the Holy God, is so pure that he cannot even look on evil. So as the sin bearer, at that moment, he's separated from his Father. The eternal bond is not broken, indeed, on the third day. The eternal bond is gloriously restored for all to see in the resurrection. Uh, but at that moment, there must be that separation as he bears the darkness of sin. Here is the mystery 
of, of cruciform love. That the Holy God, in the depths of love, enters so completely into our unholiness, into our deadness, that in some unfathomable way, God is separated from God's self. I can't explain this. I don't think anyone can explain this. This is a mystery. But it's the mystery of cruciform love. Of a God who, in a sense, abandons himself for us. He who is God himself and never ceases to be God, yet knows what it is like as a human to be cut off from God to feel utter alienation and isolation. Obviously, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God and, and in that sense can't be separated. But Jesus, as the Word made flesh, had this uh, sense of separation, of, of, of forsakenness by God. He experienced that on our part also, although at a deeper level, because he still was the second person of the Trinity, the Son, the Word made flesh, uh, in his experience, he went through the separation, the forsakenness uh, by God, which we deserved. And the story of Christ undergoing the feeling of being forsaken is the same as Christ undergoing physical death so that he can defeat it, so that he can assure us not only that death is defeated physically, but death is defeated spiritually. To talk about Jesus suffering under Pontius Pilate is to be reminded of the immense costliness of this whole business of salvation and of how very great a privilege it is that you and I can share in this salvation that he won by his sufferings. And so from very early on, the Christian church has meditated on the suffering of Jesus, not in order to be morbid and wallow in suffering from its own, for its own sake, but in order to say that when we're in the mess and the muddle, when life gets as bad as it can be, and when I get as bad as I can be, I discover that God himself has been there ahead of me and taken it upon himself. That means that God is there in the suffering with us, redeeming it, changing it, doing something to transform it. God is not impervious to our suffering. He feels it with us and he bears it for us and transforms it because Christ was right there alongside us. Very central to the whole flow of the creed is that phrase, he was crucified, dead, and was buried. The creed is emphasizing the reality that Jesus died on that cross. I think it's true to say, and you can't really say this of any other person, that this man, Jesus, was born to die. Strange thing to say. But yet if you take the gospel story seriously, and then the letters of Paul afterwards, they focus over and over on the cross. The cross stands at the center of the Christian faith. Just as he was truly born a real birth from a human mother, so he truly died. Now, from one point of view, the Christians should have been ashamed of the cross. Their leader died on a cross. It's the most despised way to die in the whole Roman Empire. Crucifixion was an exquisite form of uh, punishment invented by the Persians. Not primarily surprising to us to inflict pain on someone, but to inflict ultimate shame on someone. It was taken up and used by the Romans to keep the slaves and the, the nobodies, the offscouring of the world, in their place. Only the worst people were crucified. Roman citizens were not permitted to be crucified. It was considered too shameful. Cicero of old, 
uh, said it is the most cruel and shameful of all punishments. May it never come near the body of a Roman citizen. Nay, neither near his thoughts or eyes or ears. And then, of course, the Jews of old also reckoned that whoever was hanging on a cross was under the very curse of God. You see, the thing about crucifixion was that it was public. And secondly, that the person died slowly. So crucifixion was always held in a, in a public place. They wanted the people to come out and see what would happen to you if you dared to defy Rome. It took a while, usually took several days. Jesus died, same day he died within hours, very unusual. Usually he died because of loss of bodily fluids and uh, just the, the pain and the exhaustion. There were many crucifixions. He's not the only crucified person. There was nothing unique about that in that, uh, that many thousands actually of Jews were crucified by the Romans in the first century. The leader of the Christian faith died on a cross. The Christians didn't deny it. Instead, they affirmed it. And Paul says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. There have been many martyrs in history, but it would be a mistake to think that Jesus was simply a martyr to a cause, that he didn't know when to stop making provocative statements, that he didn't draw back in time from annoying the authorities of his day, uh, that he was a political agitator who uh, suffered uh, because he wasn't diplomatic enough in achieving his political ends. That's not how the New Testament interprets uh, Jesus at all and how the early Christians saw him. They saw him as the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. He was not a martyr for a cause but a sacrificial lamb who would bring atonement. The prophecy, again, that meant so much to early Christians that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree was said now about him. Actually, if you think of it, the first prophecy about the crucifixion that was to come, the, the redemption that was to be centered in Jesus, comes as way back as uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where the Lord says to the serpent, the snake, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He, not, not plural, he, that's Jesus, one day, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That's the first prophecy of the coming Messiah, the Savior. It's also, I suppose we could say, that the first sacrifice, the first shedding of blood takes place in the very same chapter. Verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. That means that they were clothed, but an animal died for that. And that, again, is a prefigure of what was to take place. You know, it says in the book of Revelation, the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. It's been seen from the very beginning that something was going to happen. We tend to think of the cross as something God did. And I think that's a mistake. The cross is a revelation of who God is in the essence of God's being from before the foundation of the world. When Adam and Eve fell, when they said no, God didn't say, oh, I never saw that one coming. What are we going to do about it? And then God sits down and proceeds to think and to get the councils of heaven together and they plot and they think and they plan and they wonder what they're going to do for a few millennia. And one morning God wakes up and says, I got it, wonderful idea. I'll send Jesus, he'll die on the cross, that'll take care of it. Now that's pretty silly. The cross already existed at the heart of God's being before creation because it is God's response. It is the love response of God to our saying no. The love of God is shown to us in the fact that not only did God share in all the fullness of human life, but he also shared in all the fullness of human death. It says in John 13, 1, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end to the uttermost, a love without limits. The death of Christ on the cross is the supreme expression of his love. Some people actually think that's rather morbid, but the key question to ask is, why has Christianity been shaped like that? 
why not have a conquering hero who would stride through the world sorting everything out, you know, a Superman figure? Why would you not have some divine being coming who couldn't possibly suffer? And indeed, of course, in some of the great faiths, like Islam, for instance, it's quite clear in Islam that uh, God, Allah, could not have anything to do with suffering and that if God ever did have a son, which Islam, of course, denies, such a being could never have suffered, so that Islam actually denies that even Jesus, who they think was a prophet, suffered and died. They think somebody else took his place. And so it's very odd when we think about it. What is Christianity doing focusing on this messy, appalling, tragic death? Each of the four Gospels that we have in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is written in a measure to answer that question. And for John to begin at the end, the answer is that's where you see the real glory of who the true God is. When John tells the story of the cross, it ends up with Jesus saying that extraordinary, and it's a single word in Greek, tetelestai, finished, it's accomplished, it's completed. Which is not a cry of resignation not saying it's all over. It is a, a cry, if you like, of triumph, of victory. It is completed, it is fulfilled. Which takes us all the way back once more to Genesis chapter one, in which when God has finished creation, he says it is complete, it's done. In other words, Jesus has completed the job that God sent him to do. And what is completed, what is fulfilled? The work of love. Luke sees this as the great fulfillment of the whole story of scriptures. It says Jesus explained that this is what had to happen. It wasn't a messy accident. It was God's will from the very beginning in the scriptures. And Mark sees this as the extraordinary explosive moment when heaven is opened and we see in a blinding flash who God is. So the centurion at the foot of the cross says, he really was God's son. And for Matthew, it's a way of fulfilling the covenant purpose of God. Jesus says early on in the gospel, we've got to do this because I have to fulfill all righteousness, all God's covenant purpose. So from those four different angles, and then Paul adds more and Hebrews adds more and so on, the early Christians come at this and say, the death of Jesus from one point of view was the wickedest thing that human beings ever did. From another point of view, it was the most astonishing act of the loving sovereign creator God. We see in the crucifixion of Jesus an amazing number of streams flowing together into one major stream. So here is Jesus from the Roman viewpoint, identifying with the poorest riffraff of the earth, bearing the slave's punishment, uh, and uh, they thought being done away with in that awfully undignified, painful way. But while he was doing that, actually there was another stream that may be even more significant flowing in. One is, the word was atone. We're apart from God, and Jesus in his love brings us back to God. One that meant a lot in the Middle Ages was that God was going to punish us and he paid the penalty for us. The wrath of God has been deflected away from us and onto the person of his sacred son, who has himself voluntarily taken the responsibility and the penalty of our sins. It isn't kind Jesus and angry God. It's not that at all. The whole of the Trinity is involved in this tremendous event. God is intercepting his own judgment in love in mercy at the cross so that the offense that we have been to him can be taken away and we can know what forgiveness is and then be freed to serve him in the future. We speak of Christ's death also as a ransom. The devil and the powers of the world took over and Jesus through the death on the cross brought us back. Christ has done something for us that we could not do for ourselves. We could not pay the debt of sin, but Christ has paid it and has set us free. My favorite is uh, he has victory over death. Uh, the Apostle Paul liked to say, after Jesus' death, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? Because he now shows by being dead and resurrected that he's conquered death. But while he was doing that, actually there was another stream that may be even more significant flowing in to that cross. It's the stream 
that flows from the Jewish faith, the stream that flows from the sacrificial worship. At the cross, Jesus abolished the handwriting of ordinances, to quote Paul, that was against us. And uh, here you see the cross as a turning point between the Old Covenant, which we call the Old Testament, and the New Testament, which is the New Covenant. It's the same words, testament and covenant. It's, it's the dividing point, the line of demarcation. The cross, the, it has that shadow that falls backwards as well as forwards in history. It falls backwards way back into the Old Testament. The shadow of the cross is there in the sacrificial system that was uh, instituted at the time of uh, the children of Israel with uh, sacrifices made in the temple where blood would be shed of an animal. Much of the Old Testament is concerned with uh, the sanctuary services and the sacrifices. They were the people who atoned for their sin by offering blood sacrifices. There were countless sacrifices prescribed for all sorts of transgressions, minor and major, for priests, for rulers, for common people. There were daily sacrifices, there were weekly sacrifices, there were annual sacrifices and so on. When they offered the guilt offering, they offered the sin offering in the tabernacle first of all and then the temple, the killing of an animal as a substitute for the sinner was the means by which God released them from their sin and uh, purged them from their defilement and restored his relationship with them. Why God should have chosen to do it that way is not altogether clear. The connection may almost certainly be this, that we know that the result of sin is death and therefore to deal with sin a death has to take place because the wages have to be met that the soul that sinned, it must die. God does not require the death of the sinner, but the death of a substitute. Life of the flesh is in the blood. And if you take blood away from the body, then the result is death and a violent death. The sacrifice of the animal, the shedding of its blood, was the taking of its life, was the killing of the animal, the death of the animal, the payment of the wages of sin which meant that another could go free. When the sacrifice was made and the blood was poured upon the altar, uh, in a sense what was happening was that the sin aspect, the judgment aspect, was being deflected from us and onto the animal sacrifice. And for some people, the whole idea of blood and, and religion, they think, boy, this is, this is a pagan idea. This has nothing to do with Christianity. It's easy for us to write off this whole section of the Bible is so, hey, that has no meaning to us. And from one point of view, we look back and we say, why all this shedding of blood? And the New Testament says this was all pointing forward to one event, Calvary. And when that happened, we find the meaning of all that. That was prefiguring Jesus dying on the cross. I think it's quite important for us to look at what the New Testament tells us about that. There is a book of the Bible, a very beautifully written book, a very deep book, and that's the book of Hebrews. And it is written against the backdrop of the Old Testament sanctuary services. In this book, in particular, elsewhere hints, but in this book, Jesus is called priest, our great high priest. We read about a heavenly sanctuary. And we read that Jesus' death on the cross was the fulfillment of all those sacrifices, all that that whole system was pointing to what Jesus would accomplish. Hebrews chapter 10, for example, sets out the way in which the great day of atonement in the Jewish faith, which was the annual spring cleaning, when a, a lamb would be slaughtered in the tabernacle, in the most holy of holies, and its blood would be shed to wipe the sin of the people clean. Hebrews 10 says that happened year after year, time after time. But now Jesus has come. He is the one complete sacrifice for all sin and all time. He is the one to whom all those annual rituals led up and pointed forward. He is the substitute to end all substitutes and the means of atonement that can never be surpassed. In the book of Hebrews, uh, this is all caught up. It's not taken point by point and elaborated. But it's made very, very clear that Jesus' death 
fulfills all that that old system was intended to do. Does not suggest, for instance, that there was an actual, um, what shall I say, a three-part sanctuary in heaven. If you wanted to draw analogies, where Jesus died is the place of offering of sacrifice, and that is on this earth, you know. Jesus consummates the sacrificial system. He consummates the old covenant. He fulfills the promises to the prophets. I mean, all of those imageries are used in the New Testament to speak of what God has done in Jesus. Jesus is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is the sacrifice, and Jesus is the altar on which the sacrifice is offered. So what the writer of Hebrews is doing is, is pulling together the entire sacrificial system of the Jews, the entire Jewish cultus, high priest, sacrifice, and altar, and saying Jesus has consummated the whole thing, and therefore that is no longer necessary. Ultimately, it's the cross, the death of Jesus, that saves the whole of the human race and all believers, past and present. In this way, the death of Christ extends throughout all human history. Jesus didn't only die for the people who were living in his day, and didn't only die for those who were to come afterwards, but actually his death has a retrospective as well as a prospective role. As Jesus approaches in the first chapter of John's Gospel, the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ uh, fulfills all the Old Testament sacrifices that were instituted to take away sin, but could not do so in a full and final way. Jesus is seen as the ultimate and the perfect blood sacrifice to forgive and atone for sin. The difference between him and the animal sacrifices of old was that he was the perfect sacrifice. Perfect in that uh, he had no sin of his own, uh, to atone for, but perfect too in that he was a, a volitional, full-blooded, moral human being. The animals were not quite satisfactory substitutes for us. They were good representatives, but they weren't volitional beings. They didn't have a choice as to they, whether they went to the altar or not, but Jesus did and therefore he is our perfect substitute. So the cross again is God's self-offering, his sacrificial self-offering. Here a very important thing is that Christ offers himself. He says, John chapter 10, no one takes my life from me, I lay it down of myself. If Christ had simply been seized and put to death against his will, that would have been a murder, a miscarriage of justice, but it wouldn't have been a redeeming sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. What makes the cross a sacrifice is the fact that Christ offers himself willingly, that he suffers voluntarily, and this brings us back, of course, to the theme of love. He offers himself out of love. So there I see two vital themes, the victory of love and the self-offering in sacrifice of the Lamb of God. In order to understand how important it is that Christ died and was buried, we have to first understand that death was not natural to creation. That death, as Paul says in Romans, is the punishment for sin. So that if the human race had not fallen, death would not exist. Death is unnatural in the original creation. So that death is actually more than simply a ceasing to be. That death is understood in the Bible as a power. Death is more than simply a physical exhaustion or a physical end. It is a power that invades our life. It is the result of human sin. And so death, which is the ultimate human fear, is now a part of humanity. And Christ taking on death means he took on the punishment for sin. He died even though 
he was without sin, so he didn't have to die. If death is a punishment for sin, and Jesus Christ is without sin, Jesus should not have had to die. We do, because we are sinners, but not Christ. So the death and the burial of Christ means that he died on that cross like us, even though he justly did not have to die. And in that death, he defeated the power of death. He defeated death being the final answer. He defeated burial being the final answer. It's very important to recognize that the death and the burial mean that he really died and he was really buried because that's what happens to humanity because of sin. And this very real death and this very real burial is for Jesus Christ a victory because he alone did not owe it. And because he underwent death according to God's plan, that death, which is real, became salvific. It became a power against death. By dying, he became the victor over death. But he had to undergo death because in taking on our humanity, he had to pay the penalty for our sin. And so the cross in a strange way is the ultimate turning of the tables in the universe. The worst place becomes the most glorious place. The symbol which is the most despised symbol becomes the most glorious symbol. Death becomes the place of life. Sin becomes the place of forgiveness and hope. And Christianity has always consisted of the holding together of that paradox at the heart of the faith. He's dying crimson like a robe spreads o'er his body on the tree. The Creed emphasizes that having been crucified on the cross, he was dead and buried and descended into the earth. Death of Jesus took place uh, fairly quickly in comparison with the way in which many people died uh, under crucifixion. Some people could linger for days, but Jesus dies within uh, a matter of hours. Uh, and there needs to be no shadow of doubt that Jesus really did die. The early Christians are all absolutely clear that Jesus was buried, having been very thoroughly killed by the Romans. And incidentally, some people say from time to time, maybe Jesus didn't really die on the cross. I need to tell you, as a Roman historian, the Roman soldiers knew how to kill people and their jobs were at stake if they would let anyone off the cross who wasn't actually dead. For if it could be said, as uh, some do, as some Muslims do, for example, that Jesus did not really die, but he was substituted at the last moment, or the crucifixion meant that he merely swooned for a time and then came to life again, then no payment has been made for sin, no sacrifice has been offered, no death has been offered in my place, and we're still left with the problem. So absolutely essential that we know that he really did die, and to 
to say that he died and was buried means uh, exactly that, that uh, the death was for real uh, and the death to all intents and purposes from a human viewpoint uh, seemed final and that was it. It goes back to the scriptural foundation that he did die, he was buried, um, he was dead dead, you know, he, he was physically dead. The creed then slips in an interesting little bit about him descending into earth, or traditionally descending into hell. The creed talks about Jesus descending to the dead, and Paul uses this phrase. He talks about Jesus being raised from the dead, and by that he means that Jesus really did die. This was no semblance, no appearance of death. The early Christians explored what else needed to be said about this whole strange event which was over very quickly, just three days. And one of the things that they talked about was Jesus going to the place of the dead. From the Old Testament, it talks about the pit or Sheol. Wherever the dead go, Jesus really was there. Now, in the ancient Jewish world, they talked about Sheol. It's an ambiguous word, sometimes translated as Hades or as hell. The words are probably uh, taken directly from Psalm 139, where the psalmist says, uh, speaking about the presence of God, he says, if I ascend up into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, if I descend into hell, you're there. Where can I flee from your presence? You're everywhere. We have the idea that hell is a place <laughs> where God is not. Hell is a place totally removed from God, and of course it's seen as a place of torment and fire and all of that sort of stuff. But if we think about it just for a moment, if there is a place where God is not, then God is no longer omnipresent. If there's a place where God is not, there's a place where God is not omnipotent. Because if God is not present, then God's power is not present there. So that causes us a major theological problem with our understanding of God if hell is a place where God is not. I don't think there is such a place on biblical terms. I mean, I know some Christian traditions have held that there is such a place somewhere, a place of eternal torment. In John's vision in Revelation, you get a very interesting picture of hell. It's in chapter 14, where John is, there, there are these three angels, I call them the bad news, the good news, you choose. The good news is an angel with an eternal gospel to proclaim to all humanity, all of fallen humanity in particular. The bad news is fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, and in John's vision, Babylon is that realm of being that does not acknowledge God as God. And then the you choose is, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead and the right hand, they will be tormented forever in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. John's vision positions hell right in the center of heaven. Because in John's vision, where is the Lamb? The Lamb is on the throne with God and surrounded by the holy angels. And here are, here are the people of, of hell, the population of hell, being tormented in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. Strange expression in terms of today's understanding, and it's something that can be misunderstood, I think. Part of our problem is in thinking of heaven and hell as places. And there's aspect there, but we, that's our primary identifier. Heaven is a place, hell is a place. Hell here does not mean a place of eternal torment. He descended into hell actually refers to what happened to Jesus on the cross. Uh, that on the cross he descended into hell in the sense of suffering the, the consequences of sin, the penalty of sin, uh, as we should have done. He paid hell, as, it's, as we could say, it, on the cross there and then. Hell is rather the experience of being forsaken by God. The spiritual agony 
that Christ suffered in that cry of abandonment meant that he descended into the hell that human beings suffer. The ultimate in human experience has been endured by Jesus already on my behalf. This is also a part of the meaning of death, that when Christ died, although he did not have to, he submitted to the power of death. Spiritual death is God forsaking is the abandonment of God. That is what spiritual death is. And in the devotional context where this story is read and this story is, is meditated on and preached, it's important to recognize that just as Christ defeated physical death, Christ defeated spiritual death. So that when Christ felt forsaken, he defeated any notion that we are forsaken. We are not forsaken by God. Jesus made his bed in hell. And so it means for me that there's no point in my experience where I can feel so absolutely forsaken, rejected, forgotten, alone. There's no point that Jesus already has been there. I can never say, no one knows the trouble I've seen. No one knows how bad I feel. Jesus does, he's been there. He descended into hell, and a hell that was even darker and deeper than my hell. So that no matter how deep you fall, no matter how far away you feel, no matter how much despair and emptiness is in you, God's power is greater than that despair. And God's assurance and promise on that cross is a guarantee is an assurance that that despair is not ultimate and that God will not and cannot forsake you.